really happy to have the brothers O'Neill here today. It's, it's a rare and special thing. I'm going to kick off here and um, talk a little bit about story toys and, and the background to um, our working with the Eric Carl team. Um, I think it's important that everybody knows um, that there's two other brothers in story toys. <laughs> you will not be able to guess the age. Which one do you think is older? They're <laughs> <laughs> identical twin brothers, uh, the brothers Doolin. And they founded their company in 2008 called Ideal Binary. And uh, Michelle, I think you, you remember you spoke about one point. Yeah. Very, very early, in the early days. So that's Adrian Kevin uh, sitting on Emmett's desk doing a heavy Photoshop version of his uh, office um, for an advertisement for an, our bank uh, little things. So, where it started for, uh, for Story Toys, uh, back then was, a, was an app called Rapunzel. Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick demo of this little video here. There's audio on that. So you might be familiar with this. This is what Story Toys was known for. It was creating very, very rich, standalone interactive books that we sold as premium products on the App Store. We still sell them. Michelle talked also about the long tail earlier on. This app has had a fantastically long tail for us. The app was released more than four years ago, and it's still going on today. So the only problem that we had is that when we launched the app, this is what the App Store looked like. If you search for Rapunzel, if you search for classic fairy tales, there was a couple of icons on the screen. So, results for Rapunzel, there was uh, Tangled and there was, and there was Rapunzel. Three years later, this is what the app store looks like if you search for Rapunzel. So we're talking about app saturation, and these are all the different versions of Rapunzel. And this is not just classic, wow. yeah, this is just Rapunzel. I think there's something like 250 versions of, um, of, of Rapunzel, and you know, don't even think of searching for three little pigs. So we had a bit of a dilemma, should we license it or develop original IP? Um, and if we're going to license it, should we choose literary, cinematic, or TV licenses? Uh, should we look at contemporary or heritage? And um, these slides I, I put together for Casual Connect Europe earlier on, I'm going to run through these very quickly. We, we crossed out cinema, and the reason we crossed out cinema, by the way, does anybody know this, where this graph is from? Because this is your best friend if you're working in licensing. This is from Google Trends. Um, cinematic IP, interest over time, Shrek, Shrek 3, Shrek Final, etc. It just doesn't, it just peters out very, very quickly, and that's a big IP. This, on the other hand, is a television IP. Uh, this was Chuggington, which is uh, an IP which we work with quite closely. Uh, this is actually Chuggington Global. And this is another one which I won't name, which we realized had a, you know, only had a US interest. So you can see, Google Trends is great if you're looking at getting into license IP, just to figure out the history and the, the trajectory of brands you're working on. There was another IP that we saw which we had strong interest over time, and it wasn't actually television or cinematic, or, you know, but it was actually literary, and it was uh, The Very Henry Caterpillar. And um, so I, I made a call, I think I made the first call in 2011 um, uh, to uh, must have been directly to the studio at that point to see whether the right were the rights available. And, uh, you know, because, just look at this, I mean, top 10 book list for toddlers, all-time favorites. This is, I think, the, the teacher's list, which is, it's up there at number two. The only problem was, somebody else owned it, and um, this is a video from Casual Connect a couple of years ago. Um, I've been talking about, you know, I've been talking about Duster Magic. This is before, I think, Warren, we'd even, we'd even met, or I was aware of Duster Magic. So let me just run this video for a moment. Now I'm going to show you some, some of the not so good. Who's, whoever, um, who's not had uh, the experience of the Very Hungry Caterpillar? People know the book? A couple of people know the book. Okay, let's, let's have a look at that. This app is a disgrace. When you think about the Very Hungry Caterpillar, firstly, it's a book that is designed for two-year-olds. It is designed very, to teach very, very simple principles. I could have built this as PowerPoint. First thing that a child does, you know, the two-year-old, they can't read, tap on the apple, what happens? Tap on the apple again, nothing happens, tap on the apple. So, okay, so the parent comes along and says, okay, you've got to start with level one. Please eat the lemon. Please eat the lemon. So they have very hungry caterpillar, it is about munching fruit. One. No munch that. Oh, you can only touch it once, you're not eating the lemon. Warren, I think you, you reviewed that one at one point. Thankfully, not one of ours. So, a very angry caterpillar. Yeah, a very angry caterpillar audience, I think. So, one of our issues was, though, they called us, and about, uh, yeah, I think it was about six months after, we got a call from them to say, 
you know what, the rights are expiring, would you guys be interested in pitching for the rights? And of course, we, we jumped at it, but the problem is, of course, the very, very 2D flat mm -hmm. art style. And uh, we had to figure out how, to, how we would work with that. That is my last slide, so let me hand over to Emma at this point. Needless to say, we, we, we did, the, uh, we did a, a deal with them, and um, I commenced working against this. Sorry, I, I, I'm a PowerPoint guy, and Emma's on keynote, and I think that might say a lot about various <laughs> responsibilities. <Yeah. laughs> Wait until you see the quality of the slides, and then maybe we, can, we can use laser pointers to determine should we use magic on the PowerPoint or keynote. <laughs> Do you guys want, who's the best looking? <laughs> <laughs> now we know that. <laughs> okay, so Barry just gave you a quick intro of um, story toys in general. Um, here's just a quick look at some of our other stuff. <laughs> Child. Thank you, Warren. 
despite the glowing reviews, it did okay. Um, number one app, education app in 20 countries, top 10 uh, education in, uh, in uh, US, UK, Germany, and Japan. But at the end of it, like I said, I was a little bit disappointed. So when it came to looking at what next, well, we actually had designs all in place to do more of the same, maybe a little bit better. Um, but that's when I started thinking about, well, what's, what's another angle to approach it from? What, what, what else can we do here? Um, the, the problem we had, though, was this overly restrictive style guide. So you can see you're not allowed to rotate the caterpillar. You're not allowed to um, uh, change the proportions on anything. You're not allowed to display the artwork against full backgrounds. No, no, no close-ups, no cropping, no animation. You know, it's, it's, in fairness, this is a standard Standard style guide. It's not even an overly restrictive one, but when you try and make interactive content out of something like that, you've got a pretty big challenge on your hands. Um, and the thing is, there's a lot of stuff out there that just doesn't adhere to the to, to those brand guidelines. If you look at you look at um, what teachers do in classrooms. I mean, here we've a Lego one. Uh, there, this one is made of, I guess, M and M's or Smarties um, paper plates. But the cool thing about the Very Hungry Caterpillar is it's such an iconic character that, that they're all still recognizable. Mm -hmm. They're all still the Very Hungry Caterpillar, as are all of these. As are their other licensed products. So it's, it, even, even, um, even within the design space, they were doing different things. But the, the, the main issue we had was that they were basically thinking about the digital products we were making as being... Um, extensions of the books rather than toys in their own right. Mm -hmm. So we, we made that argument to the studio and uh, produced this initial mock-up of what the caterpillar might look like and said, look, we, we want a fully animated 3D character. Um, and we got a very flat response. It was, well, the toys are derivative of the book, but now you're making a derivative of the derivative. Um, so onto the first demo. So. What we did was, um, we, we decided we'd just mock something up. Uh, so we made the caterpillar. And all you'd do was tap around the place to make fruit and you would go and eat it. So, really simple demo. But you can see there's, there's still quite a lot of that that, that made it through to the, um, to the product. So then we did a more complicated demo where we, we stuck in a background and we thought, okay, this is a nurturing app. We'll, we'll, make, it, we'll make it like a, a Tamagotchi or a Nintendogs or something like that where we can, we can basically allow the user to earn different things over time and gave them this garden area. So, interestingly, when they looked at this one, they sort of said, well, actually, you know, we preferred that white space one. That felt true to the book, so we, we wound up stripping out the backgrounds and what have you from it. Uh, we eventually got green light, and uh, I think it took about it took about four four months, maybe five five or six months, and um, to to get them to approve that 3D version. But eventually we uh, we got the thumbs up on it, and it was uh, so we we were pretty excited. So we sort of sat down and started writing out all of the different things we wanted to see in it, um, and uh, sketching out what what the different activities might look like as it goes on and on. And eventually, when my scribbles get utterly incomprehensible, I pull in a proper artist to, um, to storyboard it out. Now, again, we wouldn't typically story storyboard out every app that we do, but in this instance, because we wanted to, um, to give assurances to, um, to the studio at every step along the way, we literally storyboarded out every single sequence in the entire app. Um, and actually it was to our benefit because in some instances we had activities in there that they just they just didn't like and were at least, you know, we'd only wasted maybe half a day storyboarding them instead of actually building them and then then, then hitting the cutting room floor. Um, and then I got, um, got an email through from uh, our art director Marco um, who, who basically, we, we were trying to figure out how we could build out the world around the caterpillar. And uh, he, he basically said, well, you know, why don't we um, actually use paper craft and make everything in the app look like it's made of, mm -hmm. made of paper or card um, and send these, these mock-ups through and, you know, all, all of this artwork wound up in the final app. I think I might actually just demo the app rather than a like this video. 
people do this in Unity? Yeah. Yeah, our, our other apps are our other apps built, built in uh, proprietary technology, um, which is optimized for, for book rendering. Uh, but you know, we, we don't have things like skeletal automation systems, we don't have uh, visual tools for producers to be able to work in, and those are very much engineering -like tools, although they're getting better all the time. But um, uh, Unity was the, was the obvious choice for this sort of fast iteration, uh, being able to put that first demo together very, very quickly, and then being able to move on from there. So when Mark showed you the start point, the start stage of the app earlier, actually, um, I think it was a little bit out because the, the app, when you started it up, you actually start with an egg on the screen rather than a sleeping caterpillar, which is what you come back to sometimes. Um, okay, so um, you do, you start out with just an egg and uh, then it hatches and very gradually over time, different parts of the app are revealed to the user. So it's not an overwhelming experience when you first come in. There's just there's usually just one new thing to do, one new thing. And then over the course of the caterpillar's life cycle, you unlock all of the content. Um, but it's introduced so slowly that the user is never overwhelmed. This is the Christmas version. I'm using this because the sound is working. You'll notice the extra bells and what have you. So, you can move them around by tapping, up, tapping around the place, or you can just swipe between the screens and he'll follow you. Should follow you. Um, or you can just pick them up and move them, pick them up and move them around that way. We wanted to we wanted to make sure that however a user tried to interact with the app, they'd be able to interact that way. You can see, you know, when we when we wanted to make sure that when somebody did something even as simple as just pulling pulling a piece of fruit off a tree, that it was a satisfying experience. So you can see the little the little tug on the branches as you pull it, the leaves that fall off. So again, when the egg hatches, you uh, you you have these seeds to plant. Eventually, you can grow strawberries and things like that. Then we have things like a toy box. Of course, the caterpillars are eating. So in the toy box, we have that original ball from the first demo. But I wanted to kind of not just have expected behavior from toys, I wanted to have some slightly strange things in there too. So every kid has one toy that they hate. So this is his. The Gregory Baby Book. So he just watches it passively until it comes over. Scares him and he runs away. Until it runs out of juice, curiosity gets the better. We introduce things like uh, this paint area. Um, the paint area we added as an update. Um, with this area, we wanted to make sure it's really not following it very well today. Uh, with this area, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't just a painting app or anything like that. It was just a, a way of playing with paint. So you take your blobs of paint out and paint it in, and as I tap around the place, I leave little fingerprints. So whatever color I've just touched, I leave fingerprints that color. And really, don't try drawing anything in it because the caterpillar is just going to mess it up. Unless you put them out of the way. And you can do things like, uh, you can mix colors. So you can get very, very naturalistic effects. Um, we have to write actually new shaders in Unity to, to achieve these results. And even on the mixed colors, I pick that up and kind of like, 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 Yeah, so so instead of just having the basic colors, 
like I said, anything you touch, that's the, the fingerprints that you're making. So you, you can just about draw a picture of it. Um, it's, it's somewhat challenging, it takes a lot of practice, but it's not what we were trying to do. We were just trying to make a fun area to play, play with paint, play with colour. Then we have this, this area here. Actually, sound design is something that I probably don't talk about enough when demoing this, but you'll notice as it moves from screen to screen, there's uh, variations in the audio scape, and I think it, it really, um, although there's no sound, of the, no predetermined sound for, uh, for what, what should, what, re what represents the very hungry caterpillar, because it is just a book, um, we felt that at least by using uh, you know, these softer instruments and having a, a more abstract soundscape, that we could we could build something that was very complementary to the to the original work. Oh, and of course, if you lifted the device up, you know everything is uh, it's, it's it's a proper three D environment. So. so so everything responds whether you're swiping or whether you're moving the device, everything, uh, everything just, I guess, feel, feels like it should feel. So again, there's only one thing on screen, there's only one thing to do, and if you don't do it, it rustles. Again, one thing to do, one thing on screen. So we try tapping it. It's not doing anything. So you can see guidance kicks in to show you it's the top. Different vari variations. 
Um, but then there, was, there were bits and pieces of functionality, like in this version, he has little Zs rising up off him, but eventually we swapped it out with just those little colored bubbles, which still conveyed sleep, whereas Zs would be meaningless in, uh, in certain markets. Uh, again, big pointing hand clicking on things uh, versus the more sort of abstract triangle to, to, to kick, in, kick in with guidance. I was sorry to see this go. Um, we used to have it so that the fruit would grow back. We tried to make it look like it was stop motion. Um, that the fruit would basically grow back on the tree. In the end of the day though, in service of the app being the best app that it could be, it was a more satisfying experience if it was synced in with his sleep cycle and how much fruit you got. Uh, I'm not going to go into this too much. Um, but suffice to say, lots of lots of uh, trying of different different icons, different promotional artwork, etc. Wait, can you just go back and which, everyone point your laser at the one you think they ended up picking, and why? Well, well, actually, I think people probably saw the saw the app icon there, but but if everybody could just point at their favorite. Ah, point your favorite. I like them all. To be honest, I think that, that one that nobody's pointing at all suddenly. Uh, I think that top corner uh, is probably my favorite. I, I, I like him peeking, I like him coming out from the icon. Um, I like the 3D sense and I like the fact that you can see a little bit of cardboard, probably not from, from, from where you are, but that you can see just a little bit of cardboard. Uh, for me, it, it, it's um, the best representation of the app. But, um, but ultimately, big fat caterpillar uh, wins every time. So, um, so as I as I was saying, it's a it's a Unity project. Um, I can I can show a little bit of that if uh, if that's of any interest, or I can move on. So we have everything running in one long linear scene. So this is the pond area here. Uh, this is the sleeping area here. Here's the the, the uh, eating area, and beyond that, um, we have the the paint area and the music section. So it's it's all assembled effectively in one long interactive scene. Because again, we didn't want to have uh, lengthy transitions as you moved between sequences. We wanted to just make it make it be as fluid as possible. So when it came out, it was uh, number one in iOS Kids app in over thirty countries. Um, so, it, but it was also um, uh, in the top 10 overall iOS paid charts in 20 countries. So here it is at number three in, in Japan um, uh, in the general charts. So for, for a kid's app, we were, we were pretty happy with that. And uh, we managed to receive plenty of positive press and awards, uh, including the aforementioned, aforementioned Bologna Regassi Digital Award. Um, and it was great fun when you were walking around Bologna and you had these giant posters with your, with your app everywhere you went, you know? Oh, Somebody said, oh, nice. and tell me, what, what, what do you do? <laughs> cool. um, but user reviews are really important. And uh, these, are, these, are, um, these are some of my favorites. Uh, very good graphics, the objective is very simple. Feed and play with your baby caterpillar until, until it turns into a butterfly. My three-year-old daughter really enjoys this game. The hardest part for her are figuring out the position of the watering cans and getting Mr. Caterpillar off the sailboat overall good game. That kind of feedback is invaluable. Um, and I think certainly within a month we had put it, we'd put out a new version that, uh, that effectively fixed those things. Um, I like this one. Uh, my boys four and five love this game. Personally, I wish there was more to it. I keep waiting for it to be boring for them uh, because of the repetitive nature. But 30 days in, this hasn't happened yet. Um, and then this one is kind of cute. I'm seven, and this is still one of my favorite app I've had yet. Um, so, in terms of in terms of kind of uh, our metrics, um, obviously we we, did, we actually didn't have them on. I think for the first six weeks, so which which was obviously a very busy time. So um, this is this is only measuring since our since our first update. But uh, 30 million uh, pieces of fruit and, uh, and, and more every day. And he was a beautiful butterfly, or 117 plus thousand butterflies. 
So there's about 665 butterflies made every day. Some days we see spikes. Um, and there are 205 users that have created more than 50 butterflies. <laughs> there's about five users that have created more than 250 butterflies. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm assuming those are in schools. And um, that's, uh, that's the only way I, I can sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this is this is really really my my favorite stat. And it's average lifetime minutes in app per user is 138 minutes. Um, you know that's that is a long, uh, it's obviously over a long time. But it's just we're we're seeing retention and we're seeing uh, we're seeing continued engagement, which is a you know really um, uh, lovely lovely thing. And yes, two two point six kid years have been spent painting so far. So. I think that's also good fun. Um, so, uh, on a recent trip to New York, um, as part of the Tribeca Film Festival, they, they did a, a one-day street fair, and effectively, New Yorkers could just kind of come down, and we, we were part of the Games for Change um, pro initiative there, and um, over the course of a day, I would say, I don't know, I, I, I saw maybe about 500 kids just coming over to our stand and playing with the apps. Um, I guess the app business isn't, isn't traditionally about standing on a street corner and hawking your app, but, uh, but if anybody ever gets the opportunity to do that, it's a very, very interesting and satisfying way of, uh, of engaging with your audience. Um, so we basically set up, we set up a couple of iPads. On one iPad, it was locked to just a very heavy caterpillar. On another, on another iPad, the user could choose whichever app they wanted to play with. And we were finding that kids kept seeing the, the children using the caterpillar screen and then seeking that app out on the, uh, on, on the other device. Um, but it was just really lovely to watch them uh, playing with it, laughing at the right things, and just every single one of them felt that they were discovering the app themselves, that it was, um, that, you know, that they'd made everything happen. And that was really, really fun. Um, however, actually, uh, I noticed that every kid was still getting stuck at one particular point in the app. So, again, as soon as I was back, back in Dublin, it was another, uh, another, another quick fix. And now, I know it would be an even smoother experience for them. There was a lot of group play. These three girls wound up like leisurely getting into a physical fight over uh, <laughs> over over who got to who got to use the water can. Um, and what really surprised me was it was uh, kids much much older than you know our target audience uh, were coming over and getting really really into it. I mean, I was expecting cynicism. I was expecting them to come over and laugh at the kids' acts and uh, you know. <coughs> This guy goes, hey, what, what are you playing? I want to play that caterpillar one. You know? And they, they all just yeah, got into this nice. completely nostalgic um, uh, childhood place. And it wow. was amazing, really amazing seeing them uh, taken back to that. So we've done things, we've done updates along the way, like our Christmas update, we did a music update. Um, this footage here is from the, uh, the Japanese version, which I think I'll actually switch over to iPad and show it there. As, as, uh, as I said earlier, the app really went down well in Japan, and um, we basically, we, we, when we built this new version, we decided to add a lot more content and use it as sort of a, I suppose, more of a sandbox to experiment and try other things. So, uh, also we had a, a much requested feature, which was the, uh, the Saturday foods. Um, so, we basically introduced those, um, we introduced we, we put this out as a free app, um, so um, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, just so the Japanese market is 99% um, free content. Uh, either revenues is generated from, from free content. And, and you know, we thought that we were, well, we had a decent, a decent audience with a paid version of the plan. We thought that we, we could add more um, into a free version and make it unlockable. We added this balloon stand in um, because, again, we've tried to keep the UI to an absolute minimum in this app, but if we, we needed to commercialize it, so we, we needed to have some way of being able to, um, to buy the content. So when the user taps on this stand, they, uh, 
you, you get a pop-up dialog box actually. Um, and the first thing you have on the list is actually get a free moon. So you can see they get a significant amount of content, but we've basically just uh, ret retained the enhancements really. And again, we, we simplified things like a pond, brought it again back closer to, uh, to the original app, but somewhere in between. I think 
think our time is up. I see 12 seconds left. We've probably gone over, but uh, mm -hmm. hope, uh, hope you like the present. Thanks.